Sorry, I'm used to Google Meets. Go ahead. I had to find the I had to find the microphone. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this regularly scheduled meeting of the Board of Education. Tonight is Tuesday, February 23rd, 2021. This meeting is being held virtually in accordance with the governor's executive order. Ellen, can we have roll call, please? Yes, Mr. Carey. Good evening, everyone. Mr. Cassio? Hi, Ellen. I'm here. Hi. Mrs. Evans? She will not be joining us, I do not believe, tonight. OK. Mrs. Granato? Hi, Ellen. Hello. Mr. Lesser? Hello, Ellen. Hello. Mr. Michaels? Here. Hello. Mrs. Paradise? Present. Hi. Mr. Mike, uh, Mr. Riley? Here. Hi. Um, chairperson, excuse me, Vice Chairperson, Mr. Healy? Here. Hello. Chairperson, Mr. Carey? Present. And Weathersfield High School student representative, Tiago Wynn? Here. He's here. He's having audio issues. And I heard you. All present. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, if Miss Stephanie McKenna would lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh, student staff recognition, Mr. Emmett. Thank you, Mr. Carey. Uh, this uh, is an agenda item that has not been on our uh, Board of Ed meetings recently. Uh, it's one that I am proud to bring back. Um, this evening, uh, I would like to take the opportunity to uh, honor a uh, longstanding employee of the Weathersfield Public Schools, uh, a mentor, a colleague, a friend, and someone who I think has made a tremendous impact on uh, the Weathersfield Public Schools. Um, I would like uh, this evening to recognize Mr. Thomas R. Moore, our principal at Weathersfield High School, um, who will be retiring and leaving us at the end of March uh, after a 20 year career at Weathersfield High School. Um, typically, uh, we would have you here, Tom, and I'd have you up yeah. at the podium and we'd roast you a little bit. <clears throat> Unfortunately, um, we're remote. Um, but I will say on behalf of the Weathersfield Public Schools, I would just like to say, uh, that the Weathersfield Public Schools hereby recognize Thomas R. Moore for meritorious service and dedication to the Weathersfield Public Schools with gratitude and appreciation for your devotion to the betterment of the Weathersfield High School and the students you have mentored for over two decades of service. Presented to you this evening by Superintendent of Schools, Michael T. Emmett, February 23rd, 2021. Tom, congratulations and thank you for your service. All right, thank you. I appreciate it. That's very, very nice. I didn't realize. So, and I'll make sure that I get this over to the high school team. <clears throat> Very you. nice. Yeah. <laughs> Any board members with comments? Uh, Tom, congratulations. Two decades in the high school. That's pretty good. What was the biggest change you've seen? Well, probably the uh, the renovation of the of the school, right? So you can actually see the the physical change, right? And that's uh, actually part and parcel to what I'm presenting this evening. Right, if not for our accreditation agency, really kind of giving us a little momentum and a little umph, right, to get that referendum passed, right? Who knows if it if it uh, would have actually been passed? And you know, we were actually on probation for a period of uh, about five years, mm -hmm. right, until the renovation was was completed. So I'd have to say that that's probably the biggest change. It is a beautiful facility, one that I think we're all very proud of. And I would like to say congratulations to you, and uh, I've been with you for your 20 years as well. Yes, you have. And it's a good journey. Yes, it is. And uh, I wish you good health and happiness. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Chuck, if it's Yes, Mr. Lesser. Yes, um, Tom, I just want to congratulate you and thank you for all you've done for so many kids in, uh, in Weathersfield over the last 20 years. To be a high school principal for 20 years is quite an accomplishment. So 
I know we all are grateful for everything you've done. Wish you all the best in your retirement, but a huge thank you for your 20 years of service to Weathersfield. All right, thank you. Any other board members? Uh, Mr. Gore? Yeah. Uh, I was only at high school for four, four years, <laughs> but throughout the four years, you were extremely cooperative and extremely attentive to our, um, our ideas and our uh, interests. So an all around great principal. So thank you so much, Mr. Moore. Right, thank you, Tiago. That's very nice of you to say. Excellent. Thank you, Mr. Moore. I know I missed you as a student by a couple of years. You took over a couple of years after I graduated, but going back to all the sporting events, I've remembered you for the whole 20 years and we definitely appreciate all your time and service. So thank you. And you also mentored me a little bit during college during my 09 too, so I appreciate that. That's true, yes, right, thank you. Thank you. Mr. Emmett, any other recognitions tonight? Uh, nothing else this evening, Mr. Carey. Thank you, Mr. Emmett. Moving on to approval of minutes. Mr. Michaels, I believe you have a motion for us. I move that we approve the minutes for February 9th, 2021 regular scheduled meeting. Do we have second. a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Paradise. With uh, any comments, discussion on those minutes? All right, seeing none with a motion and a second on the table. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Mr. Riley, I believe you have a motion for us. Make a motion that we approve the minutes of February 10th, 2021, the special board of education meeting. Do we have a second? Second. second. Th thank you. Any comments or discussions? Seeing none, a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion passes, thank you. Moving on to public comment. Anyone on the phone, Mr. Emmett? Uh, no one on the phone, Mr. Carey. <clears throat> Very good. Public comment is closed. Moving on to communications, Mr. Emmett. Thank you, Mr. Carey. Good evening again, everyone. Uh, a couple of quick items for you this evening. Uh, we have a couple of discussion items uh, for you, including a presentation on the Weathersfield High School NEAS report, as well as a uh, reopening update from uh, Weathersfield's nurse supervisor, Chloe Bobrowski, and myself. I want to let everybody know that uh, as we say farewell to uh, Mr. Moore, the Weathersfield High School principal search is currently underway. Uh, the committee will reconvene tomorrow for the second round of interviews. I certainly do want to thank our student representatives, Rosario Tyne and Lily Bucci for their participation in the round one interviews. Their perspective uh, was greatly appreciated as part of the process. I'd also like to uh, express my appreciation for the feedback received through the budget workshop process. Um, as you know, uh, we have had three budget workshops over the past couple of weeks, and I look forward to be uh, able to present to you the 2021-2022 operating budget at the March 9th Board of Education meeting for your review and approval. I uh, also like to let everybody know that the district is working on the required needs assessment for the ESSER II grant funding. This grant addresses four priority areas, including academic supports, learning loss, learning acceleration and recovery, family and community connections, school safety, social emotional well being of the whole student and of our school staff, and remote learning, staff development, and the digital divide. Um, we will look to prioritize these areas and uh, look to provide supports for our students and staff that align with our strategic plan. And that is communications this evening, Mr. Carey. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Emmett. Moving on to action items. We have no action items tonight. Going yeah. on to reports and discussions. NIAS presentation, Mr. Emmett. Thank you, Mr. Carey. It uh, gives me great uh, pleasure to introduce again, uh, Mr. Moore uh, and the liaisons and teacher leaders, uh, along with our assistant principal and athletic director, Mike Maltesi, uh, and Tyler Webb and Terry Esco to uh, present to you the NEASC report. All right, good. Now, um, or am I uh, shared with at this point, Mr. Emmett? You are ready to go, sir. All right, so we'll share screen, all right, we'll... All right. All right. Can everybody see that at this point? Yep. Got it. Okay. And for a bigger screen. Aha! I can see it. All right. So let me just uh, right move on. Right. So as a little bit of background, 
the New England Association of Schools and Colleges is our regional accreditation agency accountable to all colleges and public and private schools in our six, six state region. Actually, there are accreditation agencies all throughout the country. NEAS, New England Association of Schools and Colleges is ours. Now, again, as some background, the accreditation cycle, right, especially for public high schools, is a 10 year decennial cycle that includes a collaborative conference, which is what we are reporting on this evening, a decennial visit, which will occur in two years, as well as three year and six year progress reports. So usually there is uh, four, there are four tasks in a 10 year cycle, right? And again, this is for all schools and colleges in the New England uh, area. The reports that are submitted are forwarded to uh, what is called the Commission on Public Secondary Schools. They are the ones who actually vote on the status of our accreditation. And as I mentioned earlier, in our prior 2011 accreditation, uh, we were actually placed on probation because of the condition of our building, right? Obviously we worked uh, very long and hard, right? A few years uh, off of uh, the lives of Mr. Emmett and myself, right? In terms of the entire renovation project, right? But uh, uh, it came out uh, very, very well, right? So we were able to move off of probationary status, right? If need be, the Commission on Public Secondary Schools may request additional special progress reports. And again, that was the case during our building renovation. Once a year, I had to submit a special report, right? Which documented what was happening for, um, during the, uh, the renovation. So a little bit in, in full disclosure, uh, I was one of the Connecticut representatives to the Commission on Public Secondary Schools between 2001 in 2009. And actually in 2007, I was elected as the chair of the commission and served in that role until 2009. I also served on the NEASC board of directors during that time. And I have chaired over 20 accreditation visits uh, from as close as Plainville, Connecticut to as far away as the Canary, Canary Islands. So uh, I am actually very familiar with the process, right? And you can see, right, our uh, visiting team members, right, for the collaborative uh, conference, right? The, it was chaired by Kathy Sosnowski, right, who is retired working for NEASC. Uh, Charles Dumay, who's the executive director of CES, friend of uh, Mr. Emmett. Uh, Mary Morton and Lenny Ritigliano, I think they did uh, a very, very nice job. Uh, and the collaborative conference visit report, as it says here, reflects the findings of the school's self-reflection and those of the visiting team. And so it goes uh, back and forth. And so this particular report ends up being about 40 pages, provides a blueprint for the faculty administrators and other officials uh, so they can use this right over the next several years, especially as we talk about professional development. And the full accreditation visit for Weathersfield High School will take place in 2022. Right now, overall, right, this was a, a really great report and a great validation of Weathersfield High School, of our staff, of our community, and of our educational practices. So, just as a, a an overview, right, that actually is the um, uh, what, what uh, they came up with, right. Um, so, in our our uh, self reflection process. The school had to uh, go through right, each of the foundational elements and we had to rate ourselves. And the findings of the visiting team exactly mirrored the findings of the school through our self-reflection process. So you can see right, that uh, in these six foundational elements, right, we had four areas that we met the standard and uh, two areas where we did not. So in terms of foundational element one, and I just wanna go through these quickly, just so you know what, what they are, right? Weathersfield High School, uh, without question, meets the standard for providing a safe environment. Uh, this is job one. 
This is what we do on a daily basis. And certainly through the pandemic, we have adhered to this idea of providing a safe environment, right? So not only do we have a, uh, a safe building environment, right, but also uh, the, the uh, teachers and staff provide uh, really not only a safe, but a comfortable and nurturing learning environment. So we certainly meet the standard uh, as we, we move forward on, on that, right? Uh, the second standard uh, or foundational element, right, uh, is something that will be met uh, very, very quickly. We'll be meeting this element within a matter of months in our two chairs, Kristen Musinskis and Shannon uh, Bellinger, right, will be shepherding the process as we move forward uh, in developing and actually finalizing the vision of a graduate, right? And that's the document that we're trying to uh, make a 712 document. We actually tried to make it a K-12 document. Uh, this will be completed in the spring uh, of, uh, actually that should be 2021. 20, uh, so, right, because we, have, uh, we haven't finished it, we don't meet the standard yet, right? We have our core values and uh, learning belief statement, which have guided us since 2011, right? But this will be completed very, very soon and will be brought to the Board of Education. So the uh, third foundational element uh, is one that is of uh, particular concern, right? And that deals with the whole idea of curriculum, right? So I have to tell you very, very honestly, this finding was to be expected over the course of the last 50 years, right? As I mentioned uh, last night at the budget meeting, right? Uh, really our administrative model has been systematically dismantled by the budget. Uh, during the early 2000s, we had an administrator in charge of literacy. We had one uh, in charge of social studies and the arts, one in charge of math and science, one in charge of tech ed and adult ed, as well as physical education and health. And all these uh, curriculum specialists had administrative, uh, had secretarial support, right? So those are, are five individuals that really provided the Wethersfield Public Schools with um, just out outstanding service, right? And uh, without them, right, uh, you know, the, the curriculum is in the shape uh, where it is, right? And as I mentioned last night, also at the high school, we had department chairs. And those department chairs had 40% of their role dedicated to administrative duties. Uh, each of, of these positions had a role in creating and developing curriculum as well as developing and creating really models of instruction and assessment. So I really think it would be foolish, right, to think that a system could eliminate all these positions and still get the same results, right? So I'm not uh, surprised as to, uh, as to where, where we are, right? Um, the uh, next foundational element, professional practices, right, is our school improvement and growth plan. Uh, you as a board of education see that each and every year. Uh, it is created uh, by, the, uh, by the principal and the administrators in conjunction with the school leadership team, which is the department uh, liaisons, but it really uh, reflects everything uh, about the teachers and the staff. So that school improvement team, right, isn't driven from top down. It is something that uh, is mirrors the needs and beliefs of the entire school population. Uh, learning support, right, uh, I think, and I believe that the visiting committee felt very strongly uh, that clearly we meet the standard, we go above the standard. Um, we have processes that address uh, all of our student needs, attendance, behavior, academics, certainly social and emotional functioning as we're dealing with the, the pandemic. Right, so uh, that, that was uh, very validating, excuse me. And Weathersfield uh, High School, right, uh, has a, um, right, uh, has the learning resources, right, in order to do this, right? Uh, I guess if you throw $92 million at something, usually you can get some good results with that. And our new project was completed in 2016. And as I mentioned, we are very, very proud, right, of that. Um, in the common, it's always nice to talk about commendations, right? And again, I feel this is a, a validation uh, of Wethersfield High School uh, and the community and our, our entire 
uh, Wethersfield Public Schools. All right, so you can see the commendations. Uh, they were pleased about the creation of the school-based equity team to ensure access and achievement for all WHS, uh, WHS students, right? And uh, obviously this mirrors the town effort, right? With the social justice coalition led by Mr. Emmett, uh, which uh, again, I think is the right thing to do. And again, is receiving kudos at this point. Uh, we received a commendation for the Wednesday office hours. Um, students felt strongly they were able to get help and work with teachers. They reported this to the visiting committee. Uh, the focus on mental health over academics during the pandemic, uh, the supportive environment relationship created uh, between teachers and students, which we kind of hang our hat on. Uh, but the one I really wanted to focus on is the condition, cleanliness, and maintenance of the facility. When this report came uh, to us, I immediately uh, got our head custodian, Rich DeVito, right, and uh, brought him upstairs and just let him take a, a look at this, right, because quite honestly, Right, without his leadership, uh, our building wouldn't be where, where it is today. Uh, they have done during the pandemic, right? They continue to do just an outstanding job. I can't say enough, right, about our custodial and maintenance staff. They, they really do a, a great job. And then you can see the last commendation is uh, the ability to uh, embed and interject professional development on a, a monthly basis. Right, and that is something that uh, we're currently doing, right? And uh, it has been accepted uh, extremely well. Right now, recommendations, certainly, right? This is a blueprint for us to, uh, to move, move forward, right? And you can see the, the recommendations, the idea of common assessments, uh, the idea of creating uh, a formal structure to analyze assessment data and to improve instruction and make curriculum modifications, right? Um, I have to say that, that all of these recommendations, I think we have a very reasonable chance uh, to accomplish them uh, pretty quickly, right? However, this one, uh, the second one is, uh, I think, a little bit more, more difficult, right? Uh, number two and number four here, right? So a few short years ago, Weathersfield High School worked with a, a nationally recognized educator named Allison Zamuda. Um, some of you, I know Mr. Cassio, you probably re remember this. Together, we created uh, a peer review process called Game Film Teams, right? And in a nutshell, what would happen is teachers uh, were in a cohort, right? With like, um, you know, uh, people in the same discipline for the most part. And what they would do is they would record snippets of actual classroom instruction, maybe five to 10 minutes. Uh, and what they would do is they would allow their colleagues to review and critique, right? Now, the idea uh, about this is that it was non-evaluated. So you didn't get administrators right in there providing judgment and giving numbers and things of that, that nature. Uh, this non-evaluated practice was uplifting and, and transparent, and it was a peer review process, right? And that was a, that was a, a big deal. Uh, this program ultimately uh, won an award from the Connecticut Association of Schools, right? Um, a few years ago, uh, we uh, abandoned this particular practice. I think this might be the, uh, the downside of a leader-leader model. There were some teachers, right, who didn't like it, right? But uh, this is um, something that we are going to have to deal with, right, is a formal structure to analyze data to inform and improve instruction. Uh, I have to tell you, though, currently some WHS teachers are using the game film team approach on a voluntary basis, right? And I think that that's been, been very, very helpful um, for them. So along with the idea of uh, having a, a formal structure to analyze uh, data and improve instruction, right, I need to speak a little bit about, right, instruction because I, I find it a little bit troubling and a significant issue uh, at Wethersfield High School, and quite honestly, for, for a number of years, we have a very, very traditional high school. And the instruction, in all honesty and transparency, uh, is very traditional also. A lot of lecture recitation, teacher in front, teacher driven types of, uh, of instruction, right? Um, what we've been trying to do is make instruction more student centered. 
um, less dependent on, on teachers, a little bit uh, more heavy and dependent on technology. Certainly uh, a more uh, team approach, project approach. Um, while this has been moderately successful, I think that uh, this is a part of the recommendations and something that uh, is going to need more buy-in from teachers, uh, especially some of our, our veteran teachers. And I think that the accreditation report might be a vehicle to uh, move forward in that, that particular area. So um, you can see the, the recommendations on uh, equity of leveling classes. Um, we talked about uh, data informing instruction, uh, a little bit in terms of staff or English learners, bilingual students, right? Uh, the, the last two, right, are actually fairly simple. Uh, the second to last recommendation deals with keys, right? If you read between the lines, uh, and this is something Mr. Barabalt and I have had extensive discussions on, uh, and we have this in hand. We will be taking care of uh, this very, very quickly. And then the last recommendation, right, is for a chemical hygiene officer, right, uh, in the uh, building. And quite honestly, this would probably be something better off being a 712 position, right? It's not a full-time position. It would just be uh, responsibilities of, of someone, right? So before we get to, uh, to questions, uh, I have to say that I, as a, a principal in the school in general, have been very fortunate to have the accreditation process led and nurtured by two very talented teachers, Shannon Belanger and Kristen Uzinskis. So with the department liaisons who I asked to be here this evening and right, uh, the three very uh, able uh, assistant principals, Shannon and Kristen will really shepherd this process moving forward. And believe me when I say you're in good hands, they have been on visits, they know exactly right, what, what they are doing. So what they, uh, what I envision them doing, right, because I will not be here, they will be bringing forward the vision of a graduate to the Board of Education once it is completed with the middle school. And again, uh, I think that that will happen very, very quickly. And it will be a seven through 12 vision of the graduate. And I'm sure that they will also provide an update in terms of the accreditation status, uh, the report going to the Commission on Public Secondary Schools, uh, as well as where we are in terms of all these, these recommendations. So with that, uh, I would turn it over to uh, any of the board members who have any questions, concerns, or clarifications, and I'll stop it here. Thank you, Mr. Moore. Any board members with questions, comments? And you can just unmute yourself because I can't see everyone on a screen. So I guess we'll, we'll be polite and just take turns. Nobody? All right, Mr. Moore, you're getting off easy tonight. Great job. Thank you for the update. Very good. Thank, Thank you, you to your committee members as well. Very good. Yeah, I'd just like to say, Mr. Carey, as we move forward in the agenda, a uh, heartfelt thank you to the uh, Weathersfield High School staff, uh, teacher leaders, administrators, uh, certainly Kristen and Shannon, for all of their work in uh, moving this uh, NEASC process forward. It is a tremendous amount of work. There's a lot of uh, information that has to be gathered and um, you've done excellent work. I think you've given us a great roadmap for where we need to head and um, look forward to working with you um, as we move forward. So thank you everybody from Weathersfield High School. Thank you. Mr. Emmett, reopening update. Yes, uh, happy to provide you a reopening update with uh, Ms. Bobrowski, our nurse supervisor uh, and contact tracer extraordinaire. So uh, I am extraordinarily pleased to report that we have now brought back uh, students in grades pre-K through six. Uh, we brought in pre-K through three in a phased approach um, in uh, consultation and collaboration with the Central Connecticut Health District. Um, we brought them in on February 8th, and we brought back in students uh, in grades four through six uh, just yesterday. So the buildings were a buzz, and I can tell you I uh, got to all five elementary schools yesterday, and um, the kids may have been in masks, but you could see the smiles, and you could feel the, the, just the joy of kids being back together. Uh, I went to Webb Elementary School and was talking with Mr. Craig, and he found that there were kids at Webb that had not seen each other in almost a year, which is really, really profound. So we're very happy to have our kids back. 
Uh, in terms of numbers at this point in time, um, let me give you a, a flavor for where we're at in terms of in-person learning. So Hanmer Elementary School, 82.6% um, of our students have returned. Uh, Charles Wright, 77.5% uh, are back to in-person. Emerson Williams, 76.7% are in-person. Highcrest Elementary School, 87.8% back to in-person. Webb Elementary, 88.5%. So uh, as an average across the district at the elementary level, 82.6% of our students are back into full in-person learning. So uh, we certainly like having them back. We have a total of four classrooms across the district that have all 100% of their students in. We have a kindergarten class at Hanmer. We have a sixth grade class at Highcrest. And we have a kindergarten and first grade class over at Webb. So, um, we're moving in a good direction. So, um, Chloe, could you talk a little bit about where our numbers are right now at this point? Well, I believe that's a great segue because we are moving in a good direction. Um, you know, just these past few weeks after attending multiple Department of Public Health and CSDE meetings and also listening to um, our daily updates with the Connecticut transmission um, rates and positivity rates, it's, it's really nice to know that we are past the peak of infection in our communities and it is reflected in our numbers in our schools as well. Um, every day, if you read uh, Mr. Emmett's communication, you can tell that our numbers are decreasing. Sometimes in the past, we've reported maybe nine to 11 cases on one single day. And now we're looking at an average between one and three, uh, I think last, um, uh, on the 17th, when, when we returned from our little recess, there were five uh, cases that we reported. But since then, the numbers have continued to go down. In addition to that, we have very few people in quarantine. We started with about nine students, only nine students in quarantine this morning. We did end up with 17 at the end of the day um, due to a um, community transmission. It was a, a youth sports league there was a student who tested positive. So we did have to quarantine some additional students throughout the school. Um, so contact tracing does uh, remain you know, very active, um, but our nurses are doing a great job getting information, contacting families, and then being able to have parents pick up their students so that we can continue to reduce the, uh, and um, really interrupt the chain of transmission for any COVID infections in our schools. And for that, we have remained um, completely um, without any evidence of transmission of COVID infections in our schools. And we're really proud of that. Um, we're doing a great job with our mitigating strategies. And also uh, with only 17 students, we only have one staff member who's in quarantine. And that's really great. I and mean, we've come a long way. I kind of want to be able to sleep at night. I, I can't yet, but um, we're heading in the right direction. Um, with the quarantine of the staff member, it too was related to a community um, sporting event. So we know with these sports uh, occurring, we're very happy to know that students have uh, additional activities to be able to participate in, but it does really um, uh, impact the work that we continue to do um, to keep our schools safe. Um, but we're really happy about the announcement for the vaccinations for the teachers as well. So I know you will probably want to speak a little bit more about that, and I'm happy to Fill in when you need me to. Excellent, thank you, Chloe. Yeah, just a, a couple of other items. You know, just to remind everybody with regard to mitigation strategies. Uh, as Chloe said, um, the mitigation strategies continue to be uh, extremely important. And um, I want to reiterate um, to everyone that we use a suite of mitigation strategies. It's not just one thing. Uh, certainly, mask wearing is one of the key components that we have found to be most effective in uh, preventing the spread of infection. Uh, social distancing is another one that is important. Um, I will be the first to tell you, having observed many classrooms over the past day, we're not meeting the six foot social distance in many of our classrooms. And with that, we have to make sure that we're doubling down on our others. Mass compliance, hand hygiene is critically important. Um, maintaining good ventilation. Uh, our ventilation systems in our buildings have actually been quite strong with the exception of some hiccups over at Charles Wright. So we've been in good shape there. Um, also with our physical services department, making sure that we have ample supply of cleaning materials and uh, the physical services department has ample time to get in and clean. So 
Um, we're seeing good, uh, good progress thus far. And uh, I do wanna say that we are beginning to look at the process of expanding, reopening at the secondary level as well. Given the low infection rate and given the current numbers that we have in our buildings, we are gathering data now. So for example, Silas Dean, uh, Rosalind uh, Bannon, principal at Silas Dean sent out a survey to parents uh, to gauge how many students would be interested in coming back in. Uh, as of today, we only had 56 families that had not responded to that survey. So again, if you could uh, weigh in on where you'd like to be, we'd appreciate it for planning purposes. And then administration at the high school this week will be sending out uh, a survey communication to parents uh, to take a look at high school as well. Um, I also want to make sure that I uh, touch upon the vaccine process. Uh, that has been something that has been unfolding from about Sunday afternoon to right now. Um, so we got word on Sunday afternoon that there would be a meeting for superintendents uh, yesterday that was held uh, yesterday at 11 o'clock and uh, very, very pleased to report that as of Monday, March 1st, uh, educators will be included in the eligibility for phase 1B. Um, I must tell you also the logistical process with this is ongoing. Um, we know full well that this particular eligibility group is going to be quite large as it'll encompass districts across the entire state of Connecticut. In addition to that, anybody age 55 or older, along with our 65 and older and 75 and older populations that have not been vaccinated are still in that pool. Um, tomorrow afternoon at 2.30, I will be meeting with Charles Brown, along with Clover Browski, our uh, medical advisor, Dr. Patel, and my colleagues from Berlin, Newington, and Rocky Hill and Crec to talk about uh, being able to provide a uh, vaccination clinic for our staff. Um, again, a lot of logistical um, components are gonna go into this. Um, one of the things that we're doing right now is we're maintaining the Wednesday as a remote learning day is that may provide us a level of flexibility to be able to run a clinic at Weathersfield High School when the kids are remote. Uh, we certainly have the logistics to be able to do that. We've had the EOC, our Emergency Operations Center, as well as the Central Connecticut Health District out to look at the facility. And it is certainly um, favorable to be able to run a clinic. Um, I must also say that Clover Browski and our nursing staff are looking to step up and assist in the vaccination of staff members. Uh, and I think that that's critically important as well. CCHD will not be able to do this alone. So. This has been something that we've been planning for a long period of time. Uh, with regard to the Wednesday remote days, I do uh, hope to be able to phase those out over the course of the next month. Um, we're obviously looking to see how quickly we can schedule these uh, vaccine clinics and how quickly we'll get the vaccine. Um, we believe that we have the capability to do it. Um, right now, we just have to be able to get the vaccine. Uh, Charles from the CCHD has talked about the fact that they uh, did a small startup clinic last week and we're able to uh, vaccinate 56 of um, the, some of the most vulnerable population here in Wethersfield, age 75 and older. And the CCHD has uh, clinics scheduled actually right out to Easter. So we're hopeful of being able to get staff members vaccinated as quickly as we can in March. Um, there'll be a lot of information forthcoming. And again, I just wanna to stress to everybody, patience and flexibility. I've heard that from the State Department of Education. I've heard it from the State Department of Health. I've heard it from the Central Connecticut Health District. Um, we're getting there, we're getting close and uh, very much looking forward to getting our staff vaccinated. So, Chloe, anything else? Um, well, I just wanted to let everyone know too, we are collecting data. So we do know people who have been receiving their two doses of vaccine. So we have a, a fair idea of when it, when it comes time to start, um, you know, calculating how many doses to order for our staff. Uh, people have been, you know, very good about providing information. It's private information, but at least we have some data to kind of help us kind of approximate the type of, of size of the clinic. Um, in addition, um, I just, what did I want to say? I wanted to say something. Oh, providing education. Um, that is something that is really going to be on our, um, you know, what we want to do to provide education to all staff members, 
you know, via our website, our Stillman newsletter, you know, just talking about the vaccine and hoping to be able to be resources to anyone who has any questions um, and also to provide other resources to any staff who um, may have questions about the vaccine, its safety, its efficacy, uh, the side effects of receiving a vaccine. So we're here to uh, answer all questions. Thank you, Chloe. And just to, to wrap up, I do want to um, also mention the fact that, you know, here in Wethersfield, we have uh, several other schools. We have Corpus Christi, which is a, a private parochial school. Um, we also have the Creck Discovery Academy and uh, Creck Soundbridge. Uh, back in the fall, uh, I was asked to compile uh, staff numbers for those schools. So I did uh, provide those to the EOC. And yesterday, the state asked for districts to um, be able to help uh, get these folks vaccinated as well. And not only our uh, private parochial school and uh, correct partner schools, but also uh, daycares and license, licensed daycares and other preschools here in town. So that's one of the things we'll be talking about with uh, Charles tomorrow in terms of how we can do that. Um, as I had mentioned earlier, I've been in contact with my colleague from CREC. Um, and again, if there's any way we can help to uh, support our partners from CREC and Corpus Christi, We'll uh, work to do that too within the scope of a clinic. Any questions? Any board members with questions or comments? All right, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Browski for your You're presentation. Welcome. Thank you, Mr. Emmett. Thank you, sir. All right, announcements and information, please check your packet. Make sure um, if there's a committee meeting, you can't make it, let your committee chair know. Meetings held. Mr. Michaels, we are going to lump you all together. You have the three special meetings of the Board of Education, the board workshops on 210, 218, and 222. And you had the uh, Finance and Operations Committee meeting tonight, 223, 21. You want to give us a brief update? Sure. Um, I guess we'll work backwards. Uh, we've learned that we are currently $505,119 under budget uh, for this current year. Um, those numbers are, for the most part, staying pretty uh, level where they've been. Um, and that uh, current number does include all of the transfers um, that have been made to date um, and have been approved by the board. Um, as Mr. Emmett talked about, uh, we're also looking at uh, the qualifications of how we can use the ESSER funds. So more information on that uh, should be coming out shortly. Um, so stay tuned for that. Regarding the budget uh, workshops, um, we anticipate a uh, board a budget uh, before the board on the March 9th, March 9th meeting, yes. Um, at which time uh, the superintendent will present that formally to the board. Uh, we'll have a little bit of discussion and then we would look to approve that um, that night as well and then move that on to the town council um, in accordance with the state guidelines for that time frame. Um, and then just on a personal note, a big thank you to all of the staff and administrators and board members for their work during this year's budget workshops. Uh, pretty smooth. Uh, we opened up to um, community comment at all three of our uh, workshops, but uh, we, we weren't taken up on the offer this year, but I think it was a good, it was a good change that we made from the previous uh, budget workshops last year. And that's my update. Thank you, Mr. Michaels. And we had correct council on 217-21. Ms. Granado. Okay, yes, the correct council met on Wednesday, February 17th. The correct council is the Capital Region Education Council, of which Weathersfield is a member along with 35 other surrounding towns. The council is responsible for the regional magnet schools and Project Choice, and they also organize and work the Hartford Head Start. Um, the meeting started with a presentation to the council on diversity, equity, and inclusion. The suggestion was brought forward to include in school systems a director of school climate focused on equity, diversity, and inclusion. The council also approved the correct constitutional changes about having remote meetings and the elimination of a board of directors. All policies that were approved by the policy committee and had a first reading were passed 
And Greg Floria, the executive director of CREC, spoke of the recent virtual legislati legislative breakfast, and Michael and em Emmett and I both attended. Greg spoke of the legislative agenda proposed by CREC. Um, Patrice McCarthy, who is the legal liaison for CREC and CAVE to the legislature, spoke of the um, session being in a virtual session, and she also spoke of the 24 education bills that were being presented this year to the assembly. The meeting ended with comments from the different town representatives as we were asked to share innovative ideas that were proposed in our local budgets for this year. The council is looking for towns to be innovative in areas such as equity, technology, personnel, and new programs. I spoke of our social justice coalition and the start of working in the diversity teacher program that CREC has instituted. Um, the CREC Council is a great source of information on what the surrounding towns are doing. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Granato. Meetings scheduled with us for the Early Childhood Collaborative is meeting on 32821 at 430 p.m. There is no unfinished business, public comment. Anyone on the phone, Mr. Emmett? I have no one on the phone, Mr. Carey. All right, I have some emails to read then. The first email, give me a second, is from Tracy Gianfrido, 43 Meadowgate. And she writes, Chairperson Carey, I'm writing to support, I'm writing in support of the Weathersville Early Childhood Collaborative and the wonderful work that they do. Kim Bobbin, the Family and Early Childhood Coordinator has been an asset to the town, families and education professionals across so many different groups. She has brought in programs and activities to serve under underrepresented groups, children in need, and trainings to teachers and caretakers in the area. She works not only with the Yukon PEP program in collaboration with the BOE, but also has been instrumental in co coordinating the ESL Family Literacy Program, providing multiple generation literacy to families and preschool children up to four years old. The program has a proven record of growth in English proficiency, which serves not only the families, but also the schools in the community. It has been brought to my attention that Ms. Bobbin's position needs funding to continue serving our town. I'm asking that the Board of Education provide the funding to support the work that is being done and the work that will be done in our service to our community. I respectfully submit it, Tracy A. Janfrido. And I have another email. This was sent to us, give me a second, I gotta get closer, I'm getting old. This was sent to us during our last meeting, but I didn't get it until this week. It says, earlier in the meeting, Mr. Emmett said that 70 to 80% of the K-3 students returned to full in-school learning. That leaves 20 to 30% of the children remote. My children are staying home. We've had significant and personal health concerns that are preventing us from returning. Our first grader has been having a difficult year. His passion for school has been deteriorated. His confidence has dissolved and his educational focus has struggled. Remote learning and teaching for that matter is very difficult. We hope that the summer to plan teachers could hit the ground running. That is not entirely the case. My third graders teacher has been amazing. The special teachers have been great. Unfortunately, my first grade teacher has struggled. Teaching in person and remote is difficult and a big ask for any teacher. With the reopening, we are concerned about these struggles would get worse. We brought this to the attention of the school's principal and, and asked for additional help. She replied, the school's focus will primarily be on in-person students, that remote learners will receive even fewer good Google Meet lessons. And as far as extra help, since my son has the option to be in school, she would not provide extra help. Admitting that he won't receive the same level of education as the other first graders and then following up with that, he also won't be providing extra help is simply unexcusable, illogical and wrong. It is punishing him for his health concern. It is the same health concern that would cause a BOE committee to meet virtually. He shouldn't be punished for these concerns. The remote plan is something you offer. It should strive for equitable education. Again, you said 20 to 30% of students are remote. That's 20 to 30% of your students being punished for health concerns. A proper reopen plan would not discriminate against 20 to 30% students. On Monday, my first grader's new remote schedule was put into place. He has one phonics lesson a week. The lesson is 10 minutes long, 10 minutes of phonics a week. His social emotional learning was reduced to one lesson a week and also 10 minutes long. A first grader who's struggling to read mindfulness and relationships will be receiving one phonics lesson and one ASL lesson a week with the reopen plan. He is not being provided the education he deserves. 
The remote learners are simply being punished aside due to their health concerns. I never thought I'd fight for my son's ed education, especially when we moved to a town with such highly rated schools. Earlier in this meeting, Mr. Emmett said that the schools would be receiving additional government funding. I urge you to consider some of that money for tutors, consultants, and aides to assist the remote learners. We need help. The reopening plan is pushing this aside. Thank you for your, for your work on this matter and your consideration and your help. Matt Sakulo, S-A-C-C-U-L-L-O, Ellen, and it's 169 Two Rod Highway. Did anyone jump on the phone, Mr. Emmett? No, sir. No one on the phone. Thank you. Board comment. Any board members wishing to make comment? Chuck? Yes, Kenny. Mr. Lesser. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have uh, two two items, uh, two meetings attended. One, I attended the Social Justice Coalition meeting on February 5th. And one of the big topics was, uh, there was about 60 people there, which is a great turnout, including many new members of the community, um, was community engagement and the desire to broaden beyond the 60 people, the conversation and have the conversation go out to the wider community. But obviously that's difficult to do during COVID. The hope is to host some events uh, down the road in terms of getting community engagement in terms of social coalition. So the, co the committee is meeting uh, monthly and is moving forward. And as you know, Michael is one of the leaders of that committee. So Michael, thank you for all you're doing there. And the second one is, Last night after the budget meeting, uh, we got a small break and then we had another meeting the Career Advisory Board met. Um, thank you, Michael, Jim, and, and Bobby for being there. And two items I'll report from there. One is, as I've reported before, we have a partnership with Travelers and tomorrow 12 uh, students at Weathersfield High School will be experienced in a, a virtual education in Travelers um, insurance and underwriting and all that wonderful financial stuff, which hopefully will be exciting for them. But what's really important here is that we're opening new doors for our students, giving them uh, a fresh look at other career opportunities and to have a partnership with an outstanding company like Travelers is great for Weathersfield and great for our kids. The other last item I'll report on on the Career Advisory Board is that in April, uh, we are doing a career fair virtually with um, Newington. It's a combined uh, kind of joint effort, Weathersfield and Newington. And we hope to have many, many different careers representative. And if you have represented, if you have any interest in participating, you can make a five to 10 minute video. We can give you instructions about your career. And that will be something that the students um, can, can witness and can view. So it's a little creative, a little different than the career fair we did in person before, uh, but it's, uh, it, it's a great opportunity for students to get a little glimpse of what's out there and a glimpse of what their future could li look like in different careers. So um, that's all I have. Thank you, Chuck. Thank you, Mr. Lutzer. Anyone else wishing to make board comment? Ms. Granado. Okay, as uh, Lou Michaels mentioned, the board finished its work on the budget Monday night. Um, and Michael Emmett mentioned the next step is the budget will be presented to the public on Tuesday, March 9th at our board meeting. Um, this budget is one that I believe continues to play catch up. I find us and I do go to our correct council meetings and that's where I get so much of this information. So we are playing catch up and the board is looking for public support. So please come and support the Board of Ed budget. And finally, I, I had to say, talk about this. This past week, we all witnessed the NASA um, landing on Mars, um, the rover, the Perseverance, complete with a tiny drone, Ingenuity, completed a nearly seven month journey from Earth with a perfect touchdown. Now the work is on and they're running around Mars and it all begins. But this event was years in the making and I just want to tell all those teachers out there that it started with education for all those NASA scientists. Each scientist was once a student, perhaps a dreamer or a tinkerer at a maker space or even a fearless student who always said, so let's just try it. Well, the so public school continues to work to have critical thinkers, problem solvers and collaborators for success in the 21st century. 
And a quote from the Perseverance Twitter account, the moment, quote, the moment that my team dreamed of for years is now a reality, dear mighty things. I love it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Granato. Any other board members wishing to make a comment? All right, seeing none. Tiago, have anything for us? Yeah, just something quick. Um, I just wanted to thank all the teachers in the meeting. Um, definitely through these hard times, adjusting to this educational demand. And um, overall, I think all the teachers that I've had uh, have just been doing an outstanding job. And uh, thank you to all the teachers. Excellent. Thank you. All right, seeing no other comments, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Do I have a second? Second. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Abstentions? Motion carries. Thank you, everyone. Drive safely. Have a good night. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night.